billion dollar ambition. Listing games of Slawsons, the gladiators, the businessmen who kind of like fought the white boys throughout the city. Jesse Owens' part used to be called Sportsman's part. From 61 to 63, we fought the white cats from Inglewood because they said that blacks couldn't come swimming in the swimming pool. Well, rebellions of the past was, was a predominant African-American rebellion for African-American causes and reasons. The overwhelming energy was an African-American energy and tone. These other uh, nationalities who fought in our rebellions, they adapted to our culture, they adapted to our overall movement. During the middle 1960s, during this time in American history, it's very important to point out that the Bronx was basically dominated by Caucasians. You gotta understand, when we went to school, I guess around in this neighborhood, we broke the divide. They wasn't used to no black. All this was white neighborhood. Right. So when we got here, it was the first for everybody. It was the first for us and the first for them too, but they wasn't used to us. Mm. They were not used to us. Even in school, we got a raw deal. The Bronx streets was basically dominated by Caucasians. Caucasian gangs or just Caucasians in general. The Bronx streets was dominated by Caucasians. Was there a lot of racism back then? Oh, yeah. Instead of it being called the civil rights in the future, we're going to have to label it a human rights struggle or the struggle for human rights. And as such, we can then take it into the United Nations through the avenues that have been set up in New York by the United Nations. on February 21st, 1965, Brother Malcolm X fell before the bullets of assassins. His killers were those whose interests he knew would crumble before the irresistible force of worldwide revolution against racism and dollarism. Riots broke out in many cities. 36 died in Watts in 65. Just one incident too many in August 1965. A car loaded, guys not bothering anybody, pulled over by the highway patrol. The LAPD come on the scene, slap a woman, they try and push people around. Some people begin to fight back, and it spreads like lightning through the community. It was an absolutely transforming event. Looting, murder, and arson have nothing to do with civil rights. Probably the most single important thing that happened in Los Angeles in August 1965 was the youth on the streets coming together and uniting with each other to drive the LAPD out of the community. In 65, most of your gangs segued into a political party. Like and before this, you know, the Slawsons, the Gladiators, the Businessmen, and the Watts Gang would all have been enemies. This was just a, you know, an extraordinary moment of hope and unity and pride. And this is the beginning of the whole period of, of, of radical black community organization and politics. And then you had the Panther Party came out. See, I, see I, if I can show you some old pictures. I got another coast. I had Tam. But Tam was like a beret. I mean, that's big. Before they had like that, it was Black Panther started in 66. I, in, in my story with Cam, uh, okay, me and Frank Gentry got in a fight in 57 over Tam. That's the same thing with the little thing that we got to be. The, the Panthers ain't the first one. See, and we, we already had them. See, we were resting, dressing, and impressing. Black Panther Party for self defense calls upon the American people in general and the black people in particular to take careful note of the racist California legislature, which is now considering legislation aimed at keeping the black people disarmed and powerless at the very same time. Racist police agencies are intensifying the terror, brutality, murder, and repression of black people. People were calling Vietnam a racist war. For black Americans, this had a special meaning. Fighting to improve conditions at home seemed more important than fighting a war in Southeast Asia. Black frustration sometimes turned to violence. What do you think about that demonstration? Well, if they go to Vietnam, they went on their own. The Bible said, see, we know the law is God and we ain't gonna worry about it no more. You're not gonna worry about what? We ain't worrying about Vietnam. If you went over there, you went on your own. See, we give respect to the government 100%. While we know what the government is doing for the people out here. See, we are 5% of poor righteous teachers. See, we know everything. See, we respect the government at all costs. While we are back him up. But we know he's doing his job. While we out here to do a job also. That's why we're here.
across the United States in 1967. In June there were riots in Atlanta, Boston, Cincinnati, Buffalo, and Tampa. In July there were riots in Birmingham, Chicago, New York City, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, New Britain, Rochester, Plainfield, and Toledo. The most destructive riots of the summer took place in July in Newark, New Jersey, and Detroit, Michigan. And this was basically, from my understanding, most of this was African-American people rebelling against American oppression. The Panthers brought so many resources to the community. They had the sickle cell program. They had the free clinic programs. All power. They had the, the hot lunch programs and the breakfast food programs for kids, you know. Land, grid, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. That's all on our Jay platform program. The wants and needs of the people. People in the community started relating to it, and then their children started relating and to it. It makes the teeth strong. They feed these kids, they feed the community. In fact, they have fed me. We used to patrol the community. Instead of calling the police, they would call us. Women used to cool their old man out just by saying, hey, I'm gonna, I ain't gonna call the police, I'm gonna call the Black Panther. And by this time, it was a national organization. We had branches in New York, Chicago, Oakland, which was the headquarters. Everybody knows about the Black Panthers, and they know about Huey and the Elders Cleaves and those guys in Oakland. The world needs to know about Bunchy Carter. It's a whole nother conversation about who Bunchy was. He proclaimed himself Bunchy Carter, the renegade of Slauson. There's no really books about him. You don't see him on T-shirts. here he was, some so-called nigga out to Slauson. You know, he's like the unsung true hero of Los Angeles, California, the whole community. Bunchy went to Oakland and met up with Huey and Bobby and David Hilliard, and they met Bunchy. They said, oh, man, we got to have an L.A. chapter. The Bronx streets was dominated by Caucasians. That's an important footnote for hip hop history. That's an important thing to understand as far as American history, New York City history, Bronx history. Bronx was dominated by Caucasians at that time. And then they heard of the Black Spades and they had their name and their center pets. And all of this atmosphere led it to the African American youth organizations, what they call youth gangs of the late 1960s, early 70s. Some of these African American street organizations, like the Black Spades, formed to fight oppression. You have to understand all of this in context. This is when Martin Luther King got assassinated in 1968. I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. Started the spades when we was what? 14, 13, something like that. Right now, that age. My understanding, there was youth gangs forming in California around the same time, late 1960s. Raymond Washington was just 16 years old when he created what has now become one of the largest street gangs in the world. It was 1968, 123. Right. 123, junior high school, James M. Curran. So this is where it all started, right? The space? Is where it all started, 123? 1968, 69, these are the years that Muhammad Ali was banned from boxing. Like, they took his license because he wouldn't fight in the Vietnam War. 69 books, so it's kind of... Here, right here is Raymond Washington. Just months later, he would get kicked out this school and go to Edison and start the Crips. It started because... Because we had other gangs around the neighborhood that we couldn't go past certain areas. Right. It was always threatening us. And that's the way the Bronx was, man. There was so many gangs there. There were gangs all over the place. Our projects, Bronxdale, was basically on the borderline of a lot of uh, Caucasian racist groups. Where well, there's an Italian neighborhood really less than a mile from our projects to the north. They would drive into our community uh, with baseball bats and chains and switchblades and they would beat us up or they would rob us. Like imagine like 20 white guys walking around looking like Fonzie. So the Black Spades formed as a way to protect our community. You could maybe, you know, have to go to a, a store that was in Westchester Square, and once you get there, they're going to chase you. They're going to chase you with bats and beat you. So if you ran and you got to White Plains Road, you were safe. You know, the spades had that, like, 
and cut across that. In 65, most of your gangs segued into a political party. Like I mentioned, the Slawsons went into the Black Panther Party. He exemplified, you know, the leadership that we all needed. He had laid it down, and that's what uh, we've been trying to follow for the years to uh, set an example so we wouldn't end up like the Bloods and Crips were. And it's not no gang or criminal mentality that we were trying to exemplify. This is not for you or your set. It was for your people. It was a huge and big and rich time in history. We weren't, as the media and history would have right. us believe, a gang of hoodlums. I lived there. That was yeah. my life. I wasn't just some armed guerrilla intruded in on the community. That was my home. I have... Heading up this organization is the number one G-man, the famed John Edgar Hoover. He targeted Dr. King, he targeted Malcolm X, and over 80% of the targets of COINTELPRO were members of the Black Panther Party. Most of your gangs segued into a political party, like I mentioned, the Slawsons went into the Black Panther Party. But then the other gangs, they kind of identified more with a cultural nationalist group called the US Organization. COINTELPRO was doing its mischief and, and attempting to pit the two organizations against each other. It got to the points where there was clearly uh, almost a state of war that was, uh, was existing between the two organizations. We could all feel that there was something going on that was bigger than us. Mm. The FBI had created this tension, but you had these two groups that when they saw each other on the street, it was just a, a natural confrontation. They were making all kinds of suggestions mm -hmm. and writing letters, and they had cartoons made up uh, showing Ron Karenga with his feet up on a desk and you know, things like that, and marking off uh, you know Bunchy Carter and and uh, John Huggins and you know things to do today. Scratching the, off the, the yeah, the, the, these were cartoons that were created by FBI agents. We didn't really know. Nobody believed that the FBI wanted to be bothered with some little Negroes in L.A. trying to organize themselves and so on and so forth. You know, at the same time, they were sending the same stuff to them. Correspondence propaganda between the two, between Bunchy and Karanga, telling one that the other one was doing something that wasn't appropriate. Bunchy Carter and uh, John Huggins were supposed to have been killed down in the Watts area working on some kind of a, a drug transaction. The older brothers teach the younger brothers. We emulate their example. So our example was revolution. It was a line in the book that said the Crips and Bloods are the bastard offspring of the political parties of the 60s. The leadership falling apart in the Black Panther Party, the US organization, and most of the gangs were born out of the demise of those parties. You know what I mean? So out of the ashes of the Black Panther Party came you know, gangs, grips, bloods. And, uh, you know, it just looked like a drug deal, not a, a political assassination. We were naive, and we thought that it was just another move by the US organization. There's a lot of what I call ghetto folk tales, you know what I mean? Some of it's true, some of it's not. Sometimes our own personal perspective kind of overshadows what really, what really went on. I wanted to clear up what was really going on, you know, before my time, you know. I don't believe that Karenga was working for the FBI. He might have been manipulated by the FBI. I was comfortable in making Karenga the villain. And then I had to talk to Geronimo, he was like, nah. For all of these years, the US organization has been getting a bum rap mm. behind that killing, I'm sure, bunchy above all would be uh, turning over in his grave if we were not to straighten this out. Some kind of memorandum was uncovered from the FBI which declared, though we did not pull the trigger on that day, January 1969, we did cause the unrest that preceded it. And it was hard not to uh, break his rules, you know, because they took something away, man. They just, just snatched apart our heart. And not to, uh, you know, not to hit something back, not to attack back or move to deal, you know, resolve that. It's still hard today, you know, to uh, talk about it. When you take
take something away from a community or people, the community will replace it with something. When you took the leadership away in the 60s, the youth replaced it with something. We seek the own leadership. We felt basically that the leaders of the 60s failed us because we didn't quite comprehend what they stood for. The act of violence totally on the people, without a people fighting back, it didn't make any sense to youngsters. So we formed our gangs and we dealt with our own brand of leadership. Today they call it Bloods and Crips. I don't really know who the leaders are. They're all dead. You know, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. It's like you, it's like you can't be a, a leader for the black community if you're alive. I mean, you're not, you probably wasn't doing your job. So, so when, when Craig Munson and his crew were carving out a, a name in the old Slauson territory, was that an issue back then? No, we didn't even know nothing about this. So we were grown. Until 1969, I was 26 years old. Um, the avenues, which was Munson, Donnie Boy, my brother Buzzard, Teddy Bear, Charles <coughs> Jones, Howard, uh, a uh, lot of other guys over there. And okay, see, but I told them they couldn't do that. See, that's where Raymond now got the idea. Raymond Washington was just 16 years old when he created what has now become one of the largest street gangs in the world. As the founder of the Crips, he... Raymond Washington always wanted to be an avenue, but he can't forget about the avenues. I've always called the avenues the father of the Crips, and this is why. 1969, okay, I got a police seven green Cadillac. I go up, uh, 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 you know, walking up on me, and the next, next round, catch one of these left hooks. But anyway, I go up there. Okay, I ain't never seen this dude before in my life. They, they come out of the gym. About eight Donny Boy, Craig Munson, Teddy Bear, uh, the one who used to box, uh, I can't remember. All these dudes come out. I asked you them, well, which one is Munson? He said, oh, right there. I said, man, your name is Munson? He said, yeah. I said, now, I hear y'all going around taking people yeah. coats and stuff and blah, 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 blah. The Crips got their name when they when they beat that boy down to death at the Hollywood Palladium by this leather coat. On March 20th, 1972, shortly after a concert featuring Wilson Pickett and Curtis Mayfield, 20 youths belonging to the Crips robbed and beat Robert Ballou Jr. outside the Hollywood Palladium. The Crips got stealing leather coats from the Avenues. They were the first ones that started taking leather coats. So the Avenues are the original leather jack jackers. Yes. Your name is Matt and I said, I hear y'all going around taking people yeah. coats and stuff and blah, 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 blah. You can't do that when it's nigga. Okay, and he was, you know, he's just tall. He had that big old hand. He said, damn, this is a big old spot. He was about, yeah, yeah. I don't know if he's 17 or 18 or something at that time. 19. Yeah, but maybe he was 19. Okay. Yeah. But he was a big old, all them dudes were tall, but not every one of them. Yeah. And so, and so, when, and then he said, yeah, all right, bird, and walk away. When he said that, I didn't know it. I even knew it, but to Craig Munson there came from down the street from me in the curb right before you get to 83rd. AC, you actually a founder of the Crips and a founder of Pyru, or co-founder. I, I can say co-founder because I don't yeah. have to take no responsibility fully on myself. <laughs> but nothing. but to be uh, affiliated with both Crips and and what became Bloods. I'm the beginning of both of them. Yeah. I say this again. If Craig Munson would allow Raymond Washington in the avenues, perhaps there never would have been a crib. The avenues was a big name to me and I respected likewise in that neighborhood and and wherever else they went, you know what I mean? So and I was and I all of us, you know, was uh adopted their style of life, you know, and tried to, you know, imitate and be like one. And I had one in particular like Victor Adams, he like he adopted me as a little brother, he was a little skinny guy at that time, but he Later on, as we grew, he got big and he was real. He was crippled. He like he had like a a leg defect. He was able one leg was either shorter than the other one or whatever. But he he walked, but he developed that walk and made it a cold stroll. Right. We always start walking like Victor Adams, 
and moving like Victor Adams and walking with a limp, right? So yeah, we were acting like we was crippled. I wish I could get them demonstrate that walk, but I won't. But we had that little walk like this here, right? Cause Big was big and we walked like that, right? And we're like, I want our legs with y'all another. And we act like we was crippled. What are y'all two up to? First of all, that's where trophies come from. Left field. <laughs> and we came up with the idea that Crips. You see? So this whole cripple walk was fleeking and since I got time it actually originated from Victor Adams. Victor Adams is and he don't know he know now. Cause I put it out, I put it out there. We wouldn't ever tell him back then. Cause I, we didn't say Victor Adam hit some outside of here with dumbbell for trying to imitate him. The of the name Crips has been debated over the years. Raymond had a limp. He walked with a limp up and down, up and down like that. And we all start walking like Victor Adams and moving like Victor Adams and walking with a limp, right? So yeah, we were acting like we was crippled. And he said to me, I don't want to be in the avenues no how. I'm going to go and I'll start my own game. And I said, what you going to call it, you little crip? I said that because of him walking up and down. He was, because he had a bad limp. And he said to me, that's what I'm going to call it, the crips. And he limped down the alley just like that. And that was the last time I saw him. To, to some people, they thought y'all were Baby Avenues, right? Oh, yeah, see, that's the, the impression we had left with them. Yeah. But see? But he did not live in Avenue territory, so we call him a wannabe. Then to this day, they don't know why we became Crips. You know what I'm saying? We would, I don't think none of us were going to tell them that we was wannabes and got rejected. You know what I'm saying? I won't, we were going to tell them that because we, I, I put, we had began generating fear in everybody else's heart. Now, I say this again, if Craig Munson would allow Raymond Washington in the avenues, perhaps there never would have been a crib. An altercation between Washington and the avenue's founder led to a split. And in 1969, at the age of 16, Washington left to start his own gang. Raymond decided to start his own gang, the Crips. The stories may vary. The origins may differ, but the name will never change. Raymond Washington. I look up where we're at today, and I kind of just feel like, you know, I definitely have, uh, you, know, you know, we failed. Our, our generation has failed, you know, to live up to what we're, what we're supposed to be. started kind of changing in the 70s. The clothes were changing, the individuality, freedom expression. Gone, us organization gone. Both those groups have been neutralized. Guys who I knew were, who were starch and iron revolutionaries who died for the movement. And I got out and they was telling me, man, uh, it ain't happening, homeboy. It ain't about the power to the people no more. It's about power to yourself. We're out here building a new nation for black people. It's time for you to start being some dudes, nigga. I ain't giving you shit. And I remember the same brothers when, you know, trying to emulate the Panthers was like, Getting ready to afro and laying. <laughs> Lord Jesus had dudes in the veins and the coats. And but after the Superfly movie, you didn't see no images like Huey. Yeah, all or, that was gone. All that, all that was gone. A lot of black men started saying, well, I'm not going to get involved with that. And I'm not going to get involved with that. You better take good care of me. Nothing, nothing better happen to one hair on my gorgeous head. Can you dig it? Brothers start seeing those images on the big screen. You know, it's about me. I'm gonna get mine, and they better not fuck with me. I think that was kind of like the changing of the guard right around there. Yeah, the engine movie, he won. When they start making movies like Superfly, where guys got away, then you know it, we can do it. And this kept guys like me going to jail. So, what effect do you think at the end of the movie by him winning that they had on the community? A lot of people out there in, the, in, in Inglewood Cemetery. That's the effect that they had. Oh.
This is proof that the living conditions and environment is the real problem. And this is proof that it's still.